Welcome to 10 Minute KQL. Whether you're a technology pro looking to master the Kusto query language or new to the world of IT and looking to learn your first language, 10 Minute KQL is a place to level up your skills. This is the fourth video in the KQL Advanced series. In the last session, we completed a three part series on parsing JSON objects. In today's session, we'll discuss how to parse strings. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell. In the parsing JSON series, we learned there are functions and syntax designed specifically for parsing dynamic JSON objects. KQL also has unique functions and syntax for parsing strings. There are many pre-built functions that are quick and easy to use or you can develop your own precise, customized parsing statements. Let's start out by highlighting some of the popular parsing functions that are built into the language. When we parse dynamic JSON objects, sometimes we had to cast to a dynamic data type for the syntax to work. The same applies for some but not all of the additional parsing functions. So if you run into an error as you parse, you may need to cast to a string for the function to work. For many of these examples, we're using free datasets available from the KC7 Foundation, which is a free site at kc7cyber.com. It provides free KQL-focused datasets and cybersecurity scenarios to practice your skills. In this environment, we have access to nine basic tables, which simulate the captured logs of a small company. First, let's have a look at the email logs by taking a sample. This shows basic information on email activity in the company, and the far right column titled Link has the URL to embedded links within each email. For our first example, let's isolate that field so we can practice parsing it by using distinct. As we look at the schema, we can see that it's in a string data type, which is perfect for our parsing functions. If we want to parse out only the domain from each link, we can use parse URL. We can create a new field using extend, title with the appropriate name, then define what's in the new field using parse URL. We place the name of the field we want to parse within the parentheses. When we execute this query, we see that a JSON is created, which has taken the URL from the link and parsed it into standardized key value pairs. If we examine the keys, we see the first one, titled Scheme, displays whether it's in HTTP or HTTPS. We can see the second key of Host has the domain. We can see that some but not all URLs have a path leading to a file name. For those, the path is parsed out. If we wanted to parse out the domain only from each URL, we could select the Host key. It's much like using parse JSON, where we can place a period, then the name of the key we want to parse. When we rerun this query with a key defined, we see the domain field has the parse domains from each link. When we examine the schema, we see that the parse URL changed the data type to dynamic in the same way that parse JSON did. If we needed to summarize this data, and we need to take it back to a string data type, we can incorporate that in the same record like this. Everything in the parentheses will be run as dynamic. Then the to string function will be applied. As we rerun the query, we can see that the data type is now changed back to a string. Keep in mind that as your data sets grow, some parsing functions can take a long time to finish as some may fail to complete the function at all, depending on the size of the data set. So it's best to filter the output first, so you're only performing the parsing function on the records that you need. Let's move on and sample a new table called file creation events. Let's narrow down our filter to distinct paths where files were created on host devices. For this example, we'll just take a sample of 100 records. If we want to parse out different values from this field, we can use parse path. When we place the name of the field we want to parse in the parentheses and run the query, we can see it also creates a JSON with key value pairs in set patterns, just like parse URL. We can then select different keys we're interested in. Let's parse out the root path 
directory path, file name, and extension. We can see each section is now easily parsed out, and we can filter on these fields more easily. When we look at the schema, we can see that all the parsed out fields are set to dynamic. If we wanted to parse out all the fields, we could also choose to use Evaluate Bag Unpack, like this. The advantage here is that all the fields are automatically in a string data type, so there's no need to transition back from dynamic if you need to use distinct or to perform summarizations. Another common piece of information that's useful in a digital investigation is the user agent. Let's go to the outbound network traffic table and take a sample. We can see which IP sent the traffic, whether it was a GET or POST method, the URL that was navigated to, and the user agent that facilitated the traffic. There are multiple elements embedded in each user agent, and we can parse those elements out of the string using the parse user agent function. We have three parsing options to choose from. One is the browser information, one is the operating system information, and the last one is the device information. If we start out with the browser, we can see it parses out all the relevant browser information. You can also see that there's a nested JSON, so if we need to parse out specific keys, such as the family, we can refer back to our parsing nested JSON lesson, and we could parse it in this way. If we want to parse out the operating system from the user agent, we could change it from browser to OS. If we wanted to parse out the operating system type, we could do it like this. Lastly, if we wanted to parse out the device information, we could change OS to device. But this may not be available in all user agent types, depending on the data set you're working with. We could choose to combine both the browser and operating system in one query to enrich our outbound network logs with more useful information. In essence, we're conducting multiple parsing operations in this query, so it's not very efficient. And later in the advanced series, we'll show ways to optimize queries like this. You may find that this type of generic parsing works extremely well, or in some use cases, it doesn't work well at all. It really depends on the format of the data you're working with. For fields that have uniform patterns, then the outputs are predictable. But for fields that have different patterns in each record, the output can be unreliable. In this example, we're looking at the process events table, which shows processes run on each host. When we look at the process command line field, the processes are in a variety of formats. When we try to parse path and look for the directory using root path, we can see that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We can see that for process command lines with a quotation as the very first character, the parsing fails. The KQL language has additional parsing functions built in, such as parse XML, which can help to parse out different objects. In our next session, we'll learn how to do more customized parsing of streams when the pre-made parsing functions don't give us what we need. Then we'll learn how to work with IP addresses in KQL. For homework today, use any module in the KC7 free datasets. Select the inbound network events table and parse out the type of browser being used from the user agent field. Make sure the data type is set to a string and summarize the count of each browser type observed in the traffic. Finally, render a pie chart that includes each browser type. 
That's all for today's session on parsing strings. See you in the next session. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell.